Hi, I'm Jude Madelich Hall, and this is Titles, Talk, and Tipples. With me this evening is Holly Chattel, director of the short film by Stephen King, Here There Be Tigers, uh, which won six awards, as well as the author of The Occultists. Thank you, Holly, for coming. Thank you for having me. And also, I've directed multiple films and feature films and things like that. So I'm, I've been there, done that. So great. Oh, we will definitely talk about all that. But first, I need you to introduce our drink without using without using brand names. <laughs> okay, I'm drinking an IPA um, uh, that is, I think it's local, kind of local. Um, it's a very weedy sort of IPA, and it's also got a pretty high alcohol content, which is what I like about it. It's not one of these little lame-o 4.7 beers. <laughs> This is like a 7.0 alcohol. Oh, oh, okay. You can actually get a buzz off of it. So yeah, so I'm just drinking one of those, and it's it's almost like a pilsner or something. Yeah. So it's really great. And so I'm drinking also a local IPA. You can tell that mine is obviously lighter. (laughs) I'm a wimp when it comes to IPAs. I might grimace once in a while. I normally don't drink them. But you not the, the hobby beers. No, I don't like the hoppy beer, but I always drink what my guest is drinking. So oh, oh, <laughs> so it makes me try new things, and I don't know. It's just a fun part of the show. <laughs> Great. So if I had wanted a vodka, would you be drinking vodka? Yep. I've had straight vodka on the rocks. Well, I guess that's not really straight, but vodka on the rocks was one guest, and another guest I got to try um, – Oh, what was it called? Um, green, bi- oh, bison grass vodka. Tried wow. that for the first time, which it's amazing. So I that's actually buy it now for myself. I would have never tried it. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of new things that I, those were the two, two most, uh, two things that I hadn't tried before this show was straight vodka and well, bison grass. Well- if you let me on your show again, we'll do we'll do some shots of tequila. How about that? <laughs> okay. okay. Let's go for it, baby. That's good. <laughs> All right. Well, cheers. <laughs> cheers to you. Thank you. <laughs> Happy champagne. <laughs> yes, Samhain. 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 Oh, I. Oh my gosh, I botched that. Samhain. Samhain. Okay. It looks like Samhain, but it's Samhain. Yeah. Okay. See, I've heard other people say Sam Hain, so I thought, oh, I don't know. <laughs> There's a band called Sam Hain, so, you know, but and I've been oh, yeah. corrected. I was, I said it to you, and they're like, no, it's not Sam Hain, it's Salwin. So I said, oh. <laughs> Sauna, sauna, you know, <laughs> tomato, yeah, those, tomato. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're here to talk about writing, but also other stuff. And so um, we've already talked a little bit. But I would actually, you know, and it's funny, I, with all my, um, my guests and stuff, I get, I get things confused. So I looked up the occultists um, before we got on and I saw the, the um, cover and I remember seeing that cover when it first came out and I was like, oh, I got to get that book. And I didn't put two and two together. (laughs) So, so that is definitely on my list of books to get. But, um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I can interrupt you for a second and talk about covers. Yeah. Cover I love that cover too. I did. I, love, I love the cover. I love your cover. I love the cover of of your book. And I think um, covers are so damn important. And I think people misunderstand uh, how important they are. I say I say some covers of really great books that the covers suck. Yeah. And I just want to say, don't, don't do that. There and I want to there. say the Everstein Chronicles cover fucking rocks. Oh, man. good. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, thank, my, thank my publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I, you know, I actually, I actually um, wasn't crazy about the cover. Really? <laughs> I have to admit, I wasn't crazy about it. And I was just, you know, it kind of, I didn't love it. I'm, I'm not, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. And, um, and I talked to my p- publisher about, it and I asked if we could change it. And he said, no, 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 not at this time. And I, I it was like, choose my battles. Right. It's, yeah, I yeah. also wanted to change something in the story. This was like 
just two weeks or something before it came out. So uh, <laughs> we were like <laughs> right up on it. And he was like, um, you know, we can't change the cover, but, but because you're being so, so accepting of the cover of me not changing the cover, I'm going to go ahead and let you change this thing in the story. So it was kind of like, you know, it, it was really cool that he, you know, he said, okay, we're going to keep the cover, but you can change that. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Totally. You've got to choose your battles and yeah. know which ones to walk away from, you know, but I would say, I mean, why do you not like it? Cause I, I saw it immediately. It was like, boom, I That's love it. Great. You know? Yeah. You yeah. know, I think the, um, what, what um, I, I looked it up and it's actually stock art from uh, uh, what one of those big stock art, um, websites um it's clip art yeah it was just clip art and the the person changed uh two things on it and you know and my concern was i you know i had i put it through the computer um to to make sure that no other author had it and yeah. a couple other other uh, books came up that it looked similar but not not the same and it was just, you know, it was just so similar to this other one. And then I saw one book that had a different cover, but was very similar. But three different authors had the same exact cover. Oh, and wow. I was like, I don't want that happening to mine. And, and you know, that was my fear with them using clip art, um, that, that, that that is a possibility. Right. And, and so I was like, well, couldn't we have something that, like no, no one else would possibly have, you know, right, an couldn't we get an artist to do an original. And it was just too late in the game. And, but, you know, my publisher knew what he knows what he's doing. And a lot of people love the cover. And so even though it, it wouldn't have been my choice, I think it's a good choice for what it is because of people's responses to it. it really yeah. I, mean, I would trust those guys instincts. I mean, they know what they're doing usually, yeah. you know, um, and, and I think a lot of them are stock art, you know, as a matter of fact, mine, what, uh, the one coming up was stock art. It was almost like a pre-made cover yeah. Yeah. Uh, for my next book, Shadow Days. And the guy, um, he put it up on social media, excuse me, I'm having to burp. He put it up on social media and um, immediately I was like, I want that. That's mine. And he took it, he took it down and, but it was already pre-made before I'd even gotten to it. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us like indie presses do that, you know, you're yeah, not. Yeah, that and that's that. what he said. He said, you know, um, a lot of most publishers are going to these sites. And I think it's just it's it, life is so expensive, you know, <laughs> and, and they won't they really want to put their energies and money um, to the best use. And independent yeah. publishers are not the big five. They do not have millions and millions to pour into things. And um and, you know, he was just like, it's going to be fine if at any time we need to reissue it with another cover. That's not going to be a big deal. I promise you this cover will work. And it, you know, it is. Everybody loves it. Yeah. And, you know, I just it's 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 confusing when you first start out, you know, all of this stuff that that I wasn't sure about, you know, my next round, it's going to be no big deal. You know, <laughs> you just, it's not, it can't all be fireworks. And, and to me, it was like, well, all right, cool. It's a great cover, but yeah, it's, it's I fine. I was going to cry or something when I saw the cover. The well, I mean, time. especially as like a first author, like you and I were, you were, you know, it's like the, you, it's so important to make that first impression, you know, and, everything hangs on that one thing. And, but um, it is very important. I, I, you know, I see a lot of subpar design out there and I just, I just want to tell people there's good design. that's so cheap. You don't need to pay $1,500 or whatever for an original piece. And as a matter of fact, when I found what my publisher paid the artist for my second book, Shadow Days, I was embarrassed how low it was. And I actually slipped him a couple hundred bucks on the down low, just because I was just yeah. like, dude, your talent is worth more than that, you know? Yeah. And um, they're getting paid just rock bottom. Oh right yeah. Now. You know, um, Oh, what I, I saw some comment the other day, that's a $5 cover. I was like, what the heck? No way. Like there's people who are trying to, just charging like $5 to throw someone's cover together. That author should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. But 
you know, is that like, Fiverr? The, the site Fiverr? Is that what you're talking about? It might have been. I can't, it's, you know, it's so much info. I just got back from New Orleans. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, that was like before I went to New Orleans that I saw someone comment on this, this cover that cost them like $5. And I just, I felt like writing back to them. You should be ashamed of yourself for offering an artist five. We're writers. We know the amount of time that goes into yeah. what we do. Yeah. And then, you know, I get, I get mad when someone demands a writer, uh, charge only 99 cents for their book. I can't stand that when someone expects a writer to have their book, you know, for free or for 99 cents. Um, I don't care how old the book is. I told my publisher, I never want my book to be 99 cents yeah. <laughs> you know? um, because of the amount of ener energy and time that goes into it. And, and so as writers, I think we should be just as supportive of the art artists that are doing our illustrations or our covers as we expect our readers to support us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all in this together, you know, and I found that if you, you know, in my, in my film world, um, if you treat your collaborators really, really well, they will come back, you okay. know, to work with you either for free or very cheap with 100% passion. So it's very important to me that like the whole team, like everybody wins, you yeah. know, everybody feels well taken care of and well honored and respected. And that way, when they want to work with you for the next project, they're a hundred percent on board. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> they're not going to cut corners. They're going to do the best they can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's just honor, you know, you honor their work and you're honoring your own work and they're honoring your work. And it's just a, it's kind of a, multiple the, I, I feel like it's the you know the that infinity sign you know it's like give and take and sometimes you're not always going to be able to give but because when you can you're giving so much that it totally creates this energy that um people are there for you when you need them and when you're down <laughs> they lift you up and when they're yeah. down you lift them up and yeah it's like loyalty you know it's it's or friendship you could just call it friendship you know well, let me do this. Um, <laughs> as 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 a first time writer for my last book, and I know you wrote your first book. How many? How long did it take you to write that book? It took me four years. Oh my god, that's um, crazy! It took mine four years too. Oh, I swear to god, I'm not kidding. High five! High five! <laughs> oh my five gosh, years. that's that's crazy, crazy huh? Yeah, you know it was. When I first had the idea, um, not, you know, I don't want to be repeating the same thing every show, but, sure. you know, um, and I can always cut this out if I feel like it's boring. It's not boring yeah. to me, but, and it's new to you. But, um, you know, I, it, I was, I work, uh, I, I have a day job. And at the time, my child was, let's see, um, so six years ago, they were 16, uh, 13, 13. So, you know, I was still mom and um I'm I still am mom but you know not as much as when they were 13 we homeschooled and we had a we have a property and and so I was doing the whole home family um and working running my own business I was running my own business at the time and um and trying to write a book, which I'd never done before, <laughs> but I knew I, it was this idea and I knew I had to get it out. And, um, and it, it really flowed when I would write, but I would take long breaks from it, you know, just, I would kind of put it away. And cause I didn't, I didn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't obvious that it was something until probably year three <laughs> that it was like, Oh, I'm actually going to finish this. <laughs> yeah. This is actually forming. This is something. So, so the first three years were very slow. You know, I'd write here and there. And, but yeah, for me, it was almost like, even though I was an English major in college and actually my plan A when I was a kid was to be a writer, I, I, um, I kind of got sidetracked by film and I took about 20 years off from, from um, writing so I kind of forgot how to write and I needed yeah. to really learn how to be a prose artist and put words together yeah. and get me really good sense. And so a lot of that four years was literally teaching myself how to write, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how old are you? If I may I'm 54. Okay. So I'm 46. 
And, um, but um, it was, I started writing when I was 40, but I too, I was, I wrote when I was younger and that I wanted to be a writer and I was going to go into film, <laughs> but then I got pregnant and everything got put on hold. And so I ended up actually going a completely different route of teaching yoga. Um, I had a yoga studio for years, but um, so kind of, you know, it's all very parallel kind of, <laughs> kind of worlds for a little bit. Yeah. And um, yeah. And not, and it, I took 20 years off where I didn't write for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So when you come back to it, even though you've obviously been reading the whole time yeah. and gestating this idea at the same time, it's, it's hard to, because you know, you can write a novel and have it suck, you know? Yeah. It's hard to write a good novel, mm -hmm. especially one, and this leads to another question I have, but another one that not only is a standalone work, but has a fucking trilogy. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, I'm writing a trilogy now. Here. Um, <laughs> and it's like, you know, there's, you know, it's hard enough to do one book, but to, but to know where you're going, like, three books ahead, mm -hmm. that's nuts. You know what I mean? Yeah, especially if you get the first book published before you start the other ones. Wow. <laughs> you know, some people I know, like I know one person that they're doing a trilogy, but they they are doing the whole trilogy before they ever send it off to a publisher wow. so that they can make sure all the pieces fit. And it's like, well, I don't have that kind of time. I sent my book out already. Yeah, and it is. It is going to be a trilogy, although I'm I. I'm actually writing a prequel right now that's not really part of the trilogy. So the trilogy is going to take a break for a while before I catch everybody up to this point in the storyline. Um, so it'll be like a trilogy and then these two books over here. <laughs> oh, did you have like the arc in mind when you started it or how did you, how did you work that out? I did. And actually, um, I'm kind of cheating is that um, I've always wanted to write my own version of um, Dante's uh, in Dante's trilogy, you know, the Inferno, Purgatorio, Purgatorio and Parad Paradiso. And so, you know, it's like, OK, I'm I'm creating these characters. They're going the first book. They're going through hell. The second book, they're going through Purgatory. The third book, they're going to go into paradise, you know, and not, not death wise, but that's, you know, they're going to travel to these places. And um, I don't know if it's really obvious. I haven't had anybody go, Whoa, this reminds me of Dante's Inferno, but <laughs> it's definitely there, you know, Ooh. and to the point of like, I was reading Dante's Inferno at the same time I was writing the hell series and using the levels and, the characters in Dante's Inferno, just re reusing the demons and things like that. That's brilliant. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> I mean, people do it with Shakespeare all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah all you know. Other things, you know, they they use these classics to inform where they're going, you know. So there ain't nothing wrong with that, as no. we'd say. <laughs> yeah. But people are going to have to wait, wait for Purgatory <laughs> because we've got these other two novels to write. Because my um, publisher wanted me, he said, I think that you could write an epic fantasy based on reading your stuff, your book. Um, I think you could write a, an epic fantasy. And I was like, well, what's the difference between a fantasy and an epic fantasy? And he's like, it's really long. <laughs> it's epic. Uh -oh. yeah. So, um, so I'm, that is what I'm doing right now. And so it takes place 300 years before the Everstein Chronicles starts. Wow. And it's, it's, and it's, it's great. I, I love it so much. This universe is so becoming so complete in my mind, but back to like writing trilogies, um, it's going to, I'm going to have to be careful <laughs> breaking rules and stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, you can't do that. No. And so is your trilogy um, based, uh, is it, is the occultists the first one? No, the occultist was meant to be a standalone. Oh. Um, and uh, that was all I could handle at the time. And um, I, I, you know, I could expand it if I wanted to, but I'm real excited about, you know, of course I love that book, but I'm excited about this next project I'm working on, which is a, a, a true trilogy. And I literally have like, the map of the first book, the second book and, and the third book. And I, I don't have it like worked out in every detail, but I know the general 
yeah. the thrust of it all. So I know where I'm going. So I'm literally setting up in the early parts of book one, I'm setting up the finale of book three. Oh, very Which cool. Is, you know, it's a lot of balls to keep in the air. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't it amazing how much you can keep in your head, though? Yeah. Like, I was I was stunned. Like, the things that I knew. I If I thought of... Oh, so um, let me back up a little bit. So I like to do... Uh, I like to write down vocabulary words that I don't normally use. You know, um, I get stuck in my own habitual talking. For one, we're not using elaborate, beautiful um, uh, (laughs) vocabulary all the time. And so anytime I watch something or read something and a word is used, I'm, oh, oh, I haven't used that word forever. You know, I I write it down. So I have like lists of great words (laughs) to use. And um, and I'm one of these people that I say cool a lot and awesome a lot. You know, it's great to have other words <laughs> to, that, to take those, the place of those words. And so um, I would, and then I look up the definition because it's my way of, of keeping my brain pliable. You know, I mean, we, we never can stop learning. And I've always been kind of obsessed with vocabulary <laughs> and, and spelling in a weird way. So I love word, like I'm a word geek. I love words That's and cool. I love learning new words and stuff. So, so um, I would, uh, and I was amazed looking up uh, in my novel, just like how many times I used the word great, not in, mm-hmm. not in the sense of that's great, but like great as in large and cavernous, you know, um, big and so (laughs) yeah (laughs) and so um that's just one example and so I went through and I would replace that when I realized I was repeatedly using a word um I would go in and replace it with better vocabulary and um sometimes off the top of my head but I'm not shy to say a a lot of times out of the thesaurus (laughs) that thesaurus is your friend (laughs) you know yeah. One of the things I'll do, though, if I'm in a thesaurus and I have a choice of a couple words, I'll always go with the one with the least syllables. Like, um, like in my first couple drafts of my novel of, of The Occultist, I was putting words in there like amniocentesis and things like that. And my early readers were like, I had to actually like look that word up to know what it means. And I, I kind of had a flash that, that like simpler language is better, I think. Mm-hmm. For, you know, for, for my goals, at least. And so I've actually gone through and almost pared down the language to almost like an eighth grade level or something okay. to really bring it to like its elemental form that like anybody could understand it. And like, it's not about these, you know, $5 words or whatever. Yeah. It's more about the intent of what you're trying to say. So now that I've written a couple books, I've learned my process is to pare it back down. and oh, like, okay take out those big words, you know, Ah. so simplicity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm a little, I I went a little elaborate with those bigger words, but not, not too much. I don't feel like it was too much. Like I was like, I would really love to, to use that word, but I'm not going to, I actually had someone call me on the word ersatz and um, they were like, yeah, nice nice thesaurus. It was like, it was a critique. It wasn't one of my beta readers. It was a critique from some stranger. I was in a critique group and they were like, yeah, um, I know you're getting all happy with your thesaurus, but nobody's going to know what that word was. And I was like, um, I learned that word reading Lemony Snicket. Thank you very much. That was not a thesaurus word. (laughs) I remember that word. (laughs) Yeah. So, so I did use the word, you know, that, that's one example, but you know, just not going too overboard. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's easy because we're like, you know, the, uh, you, you know, one of my constant metaphors is the heavy metal guitarist who can play so flashy, but there's like no emotion. It's all just kind of dead showiness, you know? And yeah. so the whole idea for me is to really not do that and almost go the other way into simplicity and keep it, you know, uh, sort of keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And um, it's worked for me because I've really enjoyed, I mean, that's the kind of music I listen to. I mean, the music is like three chord, four chord rock and roll or old Appalachian ballads or something. And my whole life is geared towards simplicity. You know, I'm a vegetarian, you know, and, <laughs> um, 
I like simplicity. So yeah, so it, it really like every story I do, it's simple. And even now, like I'm working my my trilogy is actually a YA fantasy trilogy. Oh, okay. Which is a whole different beast sure. because you really do you think it's like, oh, they're just like little, you know, little adults, but kind of, but kind of not, you know, and yeah. so the language is like a whole different mm -hmm. uh, tool, you know, and that one, and the first book I wrote, The Occultist, and I'm sure you had this in yours, because I think they're maybe uh, thematically similar, they take place in a certain time, and so that certain time suggests a certain language and yep. approach to language, and you know what I mean? It was a little more formal back then, yeah. and so maybe they spoke a little more formally, yeah. and so it's kind of pretty, fun to mix that up. You yeah, know? yeah, it totally is. And yeah, you know, um, I found um, that I used the word okay a couple of times and I ended up taking that out, even though the word okay existed back then. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's perceived that that it just didn't sound right. But also, you know, just taking out contractions was kind of how yeah. I dealt with some things. <laughs> and um, yeah, and just being, it, it, it is, it's just a different kind of emotion and a different kind of feel. Um uh, but uh, are, are are all of your books set in, or all of your proposed books set in that same time period? And that well, you said they go back three hundred years, but are they are they all sort of in, uh, antiquated? I guess is what. Yeah, I'm yeah. Um, my first book it takes place at kind of around the turn of the twentieth um, century, um, or no, nineteenth no, century. So um, eighteen hundred. You no, know, it's like right at eighteen eighty to nineteen twenties. It's That's kind cool. of. I fluctuate in the fort that 40 year period of time. So it's like, there's, I, I, there's a model T and model T's were, um, uh, were invented in 1910. But then I also, you know, I still have that kind of Victorian feel, but because that time was very, you know, the 1920s, there were women still wearing bustles and people still riding horses down the street. At the same yeah. time, there were stoplights and there were <laughs> cars and, right. you know, so it's just a, it's a really great time frame to work with. Um, and so it's not quite, um, I didn't go so far back as the uh, uh, strict Victorian era, because that's a little too antiquated for how I wanted it to feel. You know, I wanted my ladies to put on pants <laughs> and yeah. So how about, yeah, how about yours? Same. the same is true for the, uh, the occultists. I mean, it said in 1904. Yeah. So you obviously did a shit ton of research. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I did a shit ton of research. I mean, like you say, that's when they were still lighting gas lamps on the, oh. on the streets, but then other places had electric lights and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's, um, I've had, I had some readers, some critiquers get a little confused because it's like, you can't have this at the same time you have that. And I'm like, you obviously didn't look it up before you told me I was wrong because <laughs> that was happening. I think right. people people have a, are, are a little confused sometimes when it comes to the past. Hey, hey look, Jude, here's my wife, Christine. She's bringing me another beer. Hi, Christine. It's Christine. Hi, how are you? And she brought me another Hi, beer. <laughs> this is Jude. My husband is seen? my husband is slacking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he get, he has to get on the program. <laughs> yeah. So Look um, at your it's, face, I like isn't it. Isn't that awesome? Oh, yeah, thank you very awesome. much. It's great to meet you because I've seen pictures, <laughs> so it's nice. <laughs> oh, she's all over Facebook. Yeah. Okay, well, this is for uh, it's being recorded. So okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you, babe. You're welcome. But yeah, it's weird too. But, but you know, I mean, like you say, there's certain perceptions of that time, and then there's the reality of that time, which is often different than what people think it is. You know. Yeah. But um, I did a ton of research, and I I had a fact checker made. I made one mistake in the whole thing, and that was I mentioned Pakistan, and they told me Pakistan wasn't even a country until like in the 1940s. Oh. Oh. So I had to go back and it was actually Hindustan back then. Oh, so I had okay. one mistake after all that. So oh, I was great. proud of that. Yeah. That's cool. And, yeah. and yeah. And, and, and that's why I chose to do the range of years instead of just stick. So I, ha I had a little more wiggle room cause it's a steampunky kind of universe. And um, so I figure it's, it's okay. It's, 
no one's called me on anything yet. So <laughs> that's good. But um, Have you gotten your uh, first bad review and your first terrible review? Like, no, I haven't. You know, uh, pe people have just started reviewing. So I, I think I only have like three view reviews right now. And oh, okay, uh, good. so and they're all five. They're, you know, I'm like five stars. Only three, <laughs> so yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> you had sure. You're like, love the whole book, love the characters, love the action, hated the ending, zero stars. And I'm like, oh. what about the other parts? Yeah. Oh, great, you know? Yeah, and, and you yeah. know, that's that's one reason why I, I'm not a big reviewer, because I know what it takes to, to write a book. And, um, and I just, you know, if I read something that I really just don't like, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to write that down. <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to do that to someone. So I just choose if I, if I don't enjoy something, I just choose not to say anything. Yeah. Um, and of course, if I love something other, but I'm not a great reviewer. I mean, I've never, I never reviewed books before I was a writer. So right. it's just something I'm kind of trying to do. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's like, I want to write just a sentence and, and a lot of times Amazon won't accept that. You have to write it. I can't remember the limit of words. You have to write so many words for your review to actually go through. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't. Yeah. And people are like, again, when I tell you I'm reading your book, they're like, I'm looking forward to your review. And I'm like, oh, I re <laughs> I'm not going to put much energy into it. I got to save that energy for writing. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know? I didn't realize how much reviews uh, kind of were life and death for writers for a long time until I started writing books and they're like, holy shit, you know? So I've started to be a little bit more conscientious about reviewing my peers' yeah. books. I'll, I'll probably, after I read your book, I'm, I'll be sure to put a review up just to, you know, just for nothing else to an, an appreciation of the amount of hard work it took, you know? And yeah, you know, yeah. I don't think it does matter. It does help. Yeah. And I think, you know, no matter what, um, you can always find something good to say. And that's, you know, it's kind of like, what's the, what's the line in Bambi? If you, if you don't have something, don't, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And so <laughs> I do kind of, you know, follow that. It's like, I'm not out to hurt anybody. I'm not someone's publisher or editor. I am not in a place to say this book sucked. You know, it's like, I'm just gonna, I don't know if I didn't like it, I might say, this was an interesting concept, but I will find something, you know, I've read horrible stories, but it was a great concept. So that's what I'll focus on, you know, yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, as for the stars, I just, I wish you didn't have to always choose stars. <laughs> Sometimes you could just say, I loved the concept of, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I once read a story that the writer went through every meal that the main character ate. And it was a short story and they ate mm -hmm. like nine meals throughout the story. Wow. And I was like, but it was a great concept. <laughs> it was like, I would love you to focus on the concept and get away from, you know, what the character's eating. And, you know, it was like every time they woke up, they explained every way, every time the character woke up, every time the character went to sleep, wow. every time the character ate. And, but it was a, you know, the, the main, the plot of the story was a great, was a great concept. Were the so, meals, was that part of the point of the piece or was that? I think the person just was a real foodie. And I mean, that's the, that's what I got out of it was like, either they were really hungry when they were writing it, or they just really loved food. Um, it might have been a younger person that was, I mean, you know, that was, that was one thing I thought it might have been a younger person that was just like, I'm going to write. And, and I, and I've seen it with writer is just like, you know, just feeling like they have to go through every moment of a character's right. life. And I caught myself doing that. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this next moment. I just want to get to this other thing. And it's like, Oh, I'll just leave a, I'll just reach, you know, hit enter twice, you know, and jump to the next scene, you know, Where? so, so I've gotten even caught up in like explaining, you know, just too much. You don't have to go yeah. through every moment of the day. I know, yeah. I know I'm reading a book right now that they're like date and time stamp, you know, and it's like literally 
that would drive me crazy. They're going, yeah, it's a good book though, but they're going through a lot of little stuff that might not be necessary. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that can work, you know, like in The Shining, he puts up like Tuesday or yeah. something. But then if you notice toward the end, it goes like 2.30 p.m., 4.30 p.m. Mm-hmm. It, it, it actually compresses so it, time and it yeah. starts to kind of ramp up and it has a point to be that time focused, you know? Yes. Yeah. Like it, in, in The Occultist, I do talk a lot about food and I don't want to spoil it for people, but it all comes to a head at the end. Um, all of the food that I talk about, and it is a little odd how I perseverate on the food a little bit. And then, but at the end, there's a whole point and it comes together and you're like, ah, that's why all the fucking food. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, that's so. cool. Yeah. And I, you know, and, I, and I, I had my characters eat, like I, I have an environmental aspect, um, a green aspect to my story. Uh, cool. I mean, it's about earth warming up, you know, and like what some of the, Reasons could be, you know, my reasons for the earth warming up is because demons are rising to the surface. And that's why global warming is taking place. But, um, you know, I kind of play with that idea. But like my main character has a garden and she brings fresh vegetables, you know. <laughs> and um, so they eat a couple of times through. And, and but Tolkien said that every time uh, Bilbo took a swig of or Sam gone. Ganji took a swig of beer that was bringing reality into the story. So I think sometimes some of those things are very important to. I agree. I mean, people. I mean, look at Stephen King. I mean, look at the way he concentrates on Coca Cola and candy bars and <laughs> and and brand names of beers and TVs. And I think that that kind of extraneous ephemera, if you want to call it that. It's important. I mean, it kind of creates that, you know, it creates the scene, it creates the feel, yeah. you know, and, um, you yeah. know, so I remember there was a book called um, Snow Falling on Cedars. You remember that book? I Probably remember that, but I never read it, but I do remember the title. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the book is as much, you know, it's like a murder mystery, but it's as much about like strawberries as it is about the murder mystery, you know? Yeah. I kind of like that. It's like these little left handed things that you throw in there that are kind of cool you yeah. know well it's like ray bradbury's dandelion wine you know it's like it's it's about dandelion wine but it's also about all these other things right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i love that stuff i mean if, if you've ever read stephen king's on writing he talks about a plumbers in space uh story and he said that would actually be cool because a lot of the sort of vicarious thrill of reading fiction is you get to learn about plumbing or you sure. learn about whatever your book is about, you know, whether it's about lawyers or about accountants or policemen or, you know, like my book is about um, the post office and I talk a lot about the post office and it's kind of weirdly fascinating once you kind of break it open and look yeah. at it. And um, so, yeah, I, I think these little extra things can go a long way. Well, you, you know, know, I'm a huge Terry Pratchett fan. And something Terry Pratchett said was like, the wonderful thing about doing research is you could start. I can't remember what the first thing was. You can start looking up something about something, something and end up learning about dentures, you know, <laughs> and yeah. that's the creation of dentures. And sure enough, in, in one of his characters, he like he focuses on dentures for <laughs> for a while and every once in a while brings it in and stuff yeah and i found that too is doing research on one thing and finding other things along the way and just you know write it down you're that's interesting write it down you'll probably use it later (laughs) what was your research process for uh you know your book uh so mostly it was things dealing with um weapons uh, oh, but just just online, you know. I w- Wikipedia is great. <laughs> Wikipedia is great, isn't it? Yeah. you know. But um, with with my first book, it was mostly just I think it was just looking up um, clothing, like what what could I get away with vehicle. I wanted one of my characters to have an old car, and so I was playing with. I mean, I looked up all cars from all around the world around that time period, and the ones in the the late 1800s weren't going to do the trick. So that's when I expanded my timeline a little bit to play with. And I, and I finally just decided, I don't know what I I had this great European car that I was going to use, but um, 
it confused so many readers that I finally just said a Model T. You know, I settled for something <laughs> more. And everybody had heard, heard yeah. of it. You know, they could picture it in their head. Um, but man, I learned I learned some great things about some great cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so mostly it was is like clothing, cars, uh, uh, of, of course, looking up like dirigibles and and the technology around the time. Because I, I don't want to just fall back on, um, well, because I created my own energy source in my universe. And so I just wanted to figure out, well, well, how would that work with this? You know, there's Tesla around that time, but I don't want to, you know, everybody falls back on like Tesla with steampunk. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to create something myself. And, but, you know, knowing the information is important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I would, I would do that too. I would make notes and, you know, there were like global events like the Tunguska um, comet that happened in Russia around the time of my book. And I was like, I got to work that in somehow. I really want to talk about, you know, Tunguska because it's basically this enormous comet that came down and exploded over the landscape before it actually hit. And like, it happened in Siberia and like, 500 miles in every direction was just flattened, not 500 miles, but you know, a lot. And um, it, it happened to happen in an unpopulated area, but it was so fascinating. And I was like, I just got to make that work. And yeah, then I realized that's actually the wrong way to think about it. It's like <laughs> arbitrarily drag these events in, you know? And oh yeah. But if you can figure it out, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's not too arbitrary. And I think like with something, I can't think of anything, specifically off the top of my head but you know wanting to be like okay put this little nugget over here um i want to do something with that i don't want it you don't want it to be arbitrary and and i think something a lot of times something comes along but also i mean sometimes it's just fun throw in a news or newspaper article or something you know but it, but again it does have to somehow feed into the plot it does it has to make sense and um move the story along. <laughs> yeah, you know, save it for the next book, right? Yeah. My, the this, the book I'm doing now, I'm having to do a lot of research because it's about pirates. And so it's taking place during the golden age of wow. piracy. That's so cool. I've, I've had to, you know, I'm learning about ships and the people that were on the ships. And um, yeah, I'm learning a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Horrible stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, doing that. Oh, that's what that was something. Doing the research, I came across like um, chimney sweeps, and I ended up writing a short story um, about, you know, something that I came across through doing research. Um, and uh, so sometimes I don't always bring my research into the novel I'm working on. Sometimes it does end up going into sparking interest in another story. And I wrote a really creepy story about chimney sweeps <laughs> oh, that's cool that's yeah. creepy <laughs> so yeah um, it's crazy you know i've even got like deleted scenes from my book and i went all into what they call the four stackers like my book takes place in 1904 so it's not too far from the age of the titanic okay. and um so of course i had to put a little titanic-esque because it was a little bit before and I'd studied all that and wrote a whole chapter about the four stackers and the white star lines. And they all left from, uh, you know, from, um, Oh goodness, the Chelsea piers in New York city and everything. And I threw it all away. It's all a deleted scene. So that was like oh. of work just gone for deleted, you know? So but you delete, you just deleted it. You didn't like I, well, uh, my book originally was like a hundred and, uh, 60,000 words mm -hmm. is a big old book. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, we're in that, you know, it's so big that we're to the point that we're having to make the, the font really small. Oh. So they said, it's too big. You got to cut it. So I had to cut like 20,000 words and that would, that, that had to go. And, and then I ended up because of that, I had to restitch like chapter 11 and chapter 13 together somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, so I actually wrote a, 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 a really quick scene that I like a lot better even and it was actually one of those uh, in film, we call them happy accidents where something, you know, something goes wrong and then it happens and it actually turns out better than the thing that you hoped it would yeah. be. You know, yeah. it was a happy accident. Yeah. So I'm glad that it got cut. 
That's great. Now, would you, um, do you still have that, those scenes that you might use elsewhere? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I probably won't use them because they're so specific to that one book. Mm. Um, you know, it, really fascinating history. I mean, one of the four, uh, the, you know, the four stackers refers to the big smokestacks that are, mm -hmm. you know, up. Um, and um, one of them was actually swamped by a rogue tidal wave in the middle oh, of the Atlantic. Just this, I you know, research rogue waves. I know these, sometimes you'll just be out in the middle of the Atlantic and those 100 foot wave will just be coming at you. Um, and what they did is they actually turned the ship to face it. So it hit face on and fascinating stuff. Wow. And, um, but it's so specific to that one book that it definitely will be, you know, you know, if I ever come out with like an extended version, maybe it'll be. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my plan. I cut to 22,000 words for my book oh. and, um, but you know, I have the scenes and I told, um, and I cut, I cut them before I sent my, them to my publisher because I was reading, you know, I was reading all sorts of books about how to, you know, and, um, and I was, I kept getting information that publishers weren't crazy about having books over, I think it was 110,000 words right. or something like that. And so I, I chose to cut it back. And my husband, um, my husband pointed out, like, he was like, some of these scenes, it just kind of seems a little long. They sad. Know, like, and so, um, I took his advice and took out some of the, some of the scenes, but I ended up rewriting another scene and it turned it was one of those happy happy accidents was I took out so much that I was under the word count I wanted because I wanted to be <laughs> out exact I wanted to do 108,000 words um, it's an auspicious number I wanted to do exactly 108,000 <laughs> words and uh, I'm not going to try that again I'm not going to limit myself to an exact word count but I, I severely undercut my my word count. I think I ended up getting under a hundred thousand or hundred. Yeah, I cut twenty. Uh, yeah, something. I ended up cutting thirty thousand words or something, and so then I had to make it up. And I didn't want to throw any of those other scenes in because they were just long. So instead, I I extended another scene. And um, so when you when you if you do read my book, it's the it's the, um, oh, gosh, what are they called? <laughs> I can't, a little tipsy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a, it's a scene in hell. Um, they're in the labyrinth with the, um, ah, what's that beast called with the bull head and the minotaur? Minotaur, thank you. It's a minotaur scene. Somebody's had some, <laughs> some, some alcohol. <laughs> No, such simple words, right? Minotaur. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's a minotaur scene. And I, I, in, I ended up expanding that scene and it turned out to be a really great scene. I was really happy with this scene because it gave me a chance to get some action in there. Um, some fast paced action and kind of create some an anxiety in the situation. And that's cool. And it worked out. Well, that's the hallmark of a, of a professional, you know, is somebody who's willing to cut their hard earned work and you spent, you know, three weeks on this one chapter and it's just gone and you have to just let it go, you know, yeah. and say it's good. It's, you know, it's better for the story to let it go. Yeah. And you just, that's part of the process, you know, sometimes you go down dead ends and you end up wasting a month and that's okay. Cause that's yeah. the way it works. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah, and in the grand scheme of things, it's like, you know, you and I, we both took four years to write it. It's, I mean, that's a long time anyway. So what is it to cut a month's worth of work? And, that, right. you know, it's, and I know like some writers would cringe, you know, but I think you just get used to doing something. It's kill your, what kill your it? darlings, kill your darlings. Yeah. I will say this, though. I, I don't want to take four years to write my next one. No. <laughs> I'm having to pick up the pace. I mean, to be a professional writer, yes. I'm having to, like, like a year. Like, I, I saw, I've already spent a year on one book, and but that was because my imagination kind of stalled a bit. But I'm not going to, like, like, four years is way too oh, long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. And, I'm, you know, this this book that I'm working on, I, ha I have a year because my – 
you know, it's, I have a due date. <laughs> so, and wow. I have passed the due date. It was, it's like he said in October and well, October is almost done and I'm not finished, but I mean, I did end the story. I'm just going back and filling in some gaps. I left that's taking longer than I expected. Um, and it's a lot messier because I wasn't editing as I went along. And that was one of the other reasons why my first book took me so long was I edited it as I went along. Yeah. And I, I didn't do that this time. So it's pretty messy grammatically. And <laughs> How many drafts do you do? Um, you know, I can't really count the first one because I just I went through it so many times. But but my goal is, you know, nobody sees the rough draft, the first uh, the rough draft, only my eyes only the first draft after I go through it, my husband gets the first draft. And then after that, you know, like the second draft, I'll have beta readers. And then, uh, um, but, you know, my beta readers, and I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to have beta readers, actually, this time, my publisher has said, I probably, you know, there isn't going to be a need for beta readers. You know, once you, once you get the draft, you know, so that would, yeah, the second, second or third draft will just go directly to my publisher that's amazing so that's yeah great. we'll see i'm a little uh, <laughs> a little scared about it because my 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 first novel was so clean by the time my publisher okay. got it you know but i think it is important i like the idea of beta readers because even though a publisher and an editor knows what they're doing if you can get like three people that are completely different kind of people to read one story I mean, that was really helpful. I had a friend that does not read fiction. She doesn't read fantasy. She read my book and that was very helpful. And then I had someone that that's also a fantasy writer read it. And then someone that's like writes about superheroes. So just these different and different ages. And um, that was really helpful, but we'll see if they want to do it again. That's great. I mean, on my second novel that I turned in just recently, uh, it's going to come out in January um, I had a weird thing because I, 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 I finished it, quote unquote, finished it about this time last year. So I'd been sitting on it for a year and I, you know, worked on other stuff and I started to have these weird sort of body things as a, as a yoga teacher, you might understand this more than I do, but I was having like some real like shoulder, like tense tension <laughs> and, um, literally like my, I don't know what this is over here, but it's, it yeah. was a rock. Yeah, and, um, it was it's so. The... <laughs> yeah, and I realized what it was was this unconscious stress about this novel that it wasn't done yet, and my my unconscious knew that it wasn't done, even though my conscious was like, "Yeah, we've done, you know, seven drafts, we're done." It wasn't done, mm-hmm. so I had to, you know, I spent um, the late summer, like basically July through last month cramming uh just doing draft after draft after draft hitting it hard 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 because i realized in my heart of hearts it wasn't done and it was going to go wide out into the public and it was going to have my name on it it was going to be like the uh you know representation of me at this time forever and i was just like my body just locked up and until i did solve it and thank god i did but it was almost like my body knew better than i did when it was done you know you know, and I'm trying to figure that out, too, because I feel like I'm dragging my feet. And I did just go on vacation and I did not write. I didn't even look at my manuscript while I was on vacation. Even I took all my stuff with me, but I didn't even look at it. And it's and, due now, right? Yeah, it's due like now. <laughs> and every time I talk to him, um, you know, he's like, so how's it coming along? And I'm like, I'm still I'm still working away at it it's taking me a lot longer than I thought and I've been working on it since November 1st of last year and (laughs) and it's 150,000 words right now and creeping up to 160 so it might be 160 by the time I'm truly done but um you know it's kind of I I really thought I'd be done by now because I actually wrote the last scene Uh, I'd have to look back on in my writers group when I posted, I just finished it. <laughs> um, but that, that was probably four months ago. And I'm still just like, 
these just little chipping away. I think I kind of just, I finished it and my brain went, let's just shut down for a couple of months. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird. And I think I'm just, you know, it's that my body's telling me something like something's not right that I, yeah, there's, there's wisdom, you know, in our yeah. tissue, you know, yeah. you know, you know what you do, I think sometimes, Absolutely. You know, but that's still a quick turnaround. I mean, I couldn't imagine that the stress of that, because that's a big ass book doing that in a year, you know, yeah. and making it really high quality and mm-hmm. tight where every single word has to be there. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, and so, I mean, if I, and he was saying, if, if you take till November, December, that's going to be fine. But that's kind of the limit um, because we want to put it out next October. And so we need a good amount of time um, just for, re, you know, giving, giving time for rewriting. I'm working with, I'll, I'll be working with an illustrator, you know, things like that. And um, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, I have my, I have my illustrator from my other book and, and I just, I pay her, my publisher doesn't pay her. That's my own thing. Cause my publisher is like, you don't need illustrations, but, but I want illustrations. So I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll pay for it. I, you know, and. Um, That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I it, love illustrations. Why not have so more illustrations, you know? Yeah. I, I loved, you know, and especially when you're surprised, but you know, you're reading along and then like, ah, oh, adult books with illustrations, you know, it's, nice you know yeah no it's great let me ask you another question i'm I'm kind of infamous for turning interviews around onto the oh that's fine (laughs) i apologize if i'm too aggressive um (laughs) but uh what is your like what what's your most amazing reading experience like what are you trying to replicate for your own readers when you write something that you got from other authors like like for me i'll I'll, it was an edgar rice burroughs book I had a bus trip, you know, I'm old and um, I had forever and it was me in a bus with Edgar Rice Burroughs and just, I lost myself and I was Mm -hmm. just gone. And it's one of those things where that magic that, you know, the magic of that moment is what I try to recreate for my readers. So what are you trying to recreate with your readers? You know, I want, I, I want to bring some awareness to the human condition you know, in a fun way. And one thing that I absolutely adore, and there's no specific novel because this man has written so many. Terry Pratchett is my favorite author. And I, it's, it's truthful. There's like, there's like this great, it's satire, right? So it's, there's this great weight of truthfulness in the human condition, but I will also laugh out loud at the absurdity and, you know, get carried away with the whimsy of it and the magic of it, where at at the same time, it's not um, hokey. You know, I don't, I don't want to be hokey with fantasy. And, um, and he pulled all of that off. Yeah. And, um, but also I love Ray Bradbury and I mentioned Dandelion Wine. And I would have to say that if I were to have to choose one book, that was my favorite book, it would be Dandelion Wine. That's cool. Just because of the poetry, the, the Ray Bradbury's, you know, he was a genius. composition, you know, it was like he was composing music yeah. with his writing. Yeah, just the vision he had, you know, to tie in like this lyricism with, you know, the October country or whatever, just to, to find the lyricism within Halloween, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, he he's he's essential, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've actually never read a Terry Pratchett book. I've never uh, ever read any of those books. Yeah, I just um Hogfather is great. Going postal is probably my favorite. Um I close There's so I many could, of them though. It's like where do you start with all you of know, those? The great thing about Terry Pratchett is it's not a it it, it, is, it is a series, but it you don't have to go in order. Oh really? So you can grab anything. And um, I started from, you know, his very first Discworld book to, yeah, I'm going, going in order, but you definitely don't have to. So I would recommend Hogfather at this time of year. It's great. It's like a twist on Christmas um, without being Christmassy, but you also get like death, the character, the, you know, Grim Reaper, you get all this, these great characters. And um, 
going postal is just brilliant and it's crazy. It's absolutely just like insanity. It's so great. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah. I mean, he, his, his, his star is very high, you know, he comes highly, highly respected and highly. um, Yeah. So it's only a matter of time till I get to him. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, someone else that I really adore that um, I wish um, she wrote more books um, is Susanna Clark, the woman who wrote, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, but she, she's very much like a combination of Ray Bradbury and Terry Pratchett in my mind. Like she, she gets that kind of sarcasm. There's some dark humor in it, you know? And, um, but that also that brilliant, sometimes I'll laugh, not because something's funny, but because something's so brilliant, you know, yeah, and, um, and there's illustrations. <laughs> and uh, just her characterization but you know that's something doing like a, a historical fantasy or historical fiction I, I don't feel like I have the capacity to to do that much research I don't want to spend 10 years writing a book um, although her book was it was actually three books and one um, but it took her like 10 years and she just I haven't read her recent book which is Pyrenees Piranesi, um, but I've been reading wonderful. I bought it. It's sitting on my bookshelf. But um, yeah, she's she's someone that you know. She has three books out. That's it. <laughs> so it's like I'm waiting. I don't I don't want to read all her books before you know um, before she comes out with another one. And it, she might not. I don't know. It's taken her a long time. Yeah, it's a masterwork for sure. I mean, ten years to write a book. That's um. That's Donna Tart territory. You know Donna Tart, right? Uh, she wrote the Secret History, and she wrote the Goldfinch. Oh, okay, and yeah. She wrote the, the Little Friend, and fabulous, fabulous writer. If, if I can, if I can steer you to one, please read the Secret History. It's one of my favorite books. Okay. But every book takes her ten years to do, and that's yeah. just three books in thirty years. It's like, come on. <laughs> Yeah. And so I I definitely want to write more than that. And I think a year is good. You know, I think my next book, um, I think I'm just going to get a little faster, you know, and my, and my husband though, like he's reading the beginnings of this book and he's like, you kind of lost a little something here and there. Like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm having to write it faster. And he's like, no, you don't, you can take as much time as you want. I'm like, yeah, in a way, I mean, there is a, you know, definitely want to leave that room to, um, to work with your own style and to get the story right. And you don't want to lose, but you're gonna evolve in different ways. Every, every story is going to be different. And it's like, and I tried to tell him, I'm like, you know, I don't know if I can capture that essence of that first novel. That was like just an epiphany and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it like entered my mind and I knew that story from start to finish. You know, I, all I did was have to write it down. Everything just unfolded before me. I, I never had to struggle with where the story was going. I knew where it was going the whole time. And with this one, it's been a little different. Like I had a concept that I wasn't even going to touch until the trilogy was done. But then we decided to do it now. And it's like, okay, just trust. My, my publisher was like, just trust yourself, <laughs> trust your ability. And that's what this is. It, this is, and it's been very interesting. And I, I, I like this story. I really enjoy it, but it wasn't the great epiphany that my first one was. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the difference between like the one time novelist and the professional novelist is they, they, they get to work and they turn them out, you know, and they don't, they don't necessarily wait for inspiration. They just get it done. You know, you got to get it done. You got people waiting on you. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. And so I think, you know, and some people would have a problem with that. I think, I think there's a lot of artists that would be like, well, if the muse isn't there, you know, but it's like, in my mind, it's like the muse is always there. It just might be a little obstructed. It might be a little hidden. It might not be obvious. Right. I think the muse is always there. There's always something to write. Yeah, I mean, but you know what? I've I've found a real uh, a real uh, sort of pitfall is in my writing. Like my new book, I kind of did stall a little bit. I did like I, it's not that I didn't know what to write. It was almost like I didn't know how to write it. And 
I would just get my word count of the day, yeah. blah, 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 you know, chicka, chicka, chicka. Oh my sure. God. And then, and then three months later, I go back and revisit it and it's crap because it's yeah. just, it's literally like busy work. Yeah. It's literally like just putting words down on the page mm -hmm. and hoping they work. And, and I go back and I'm like, I don't even need this stuff. Yeah. And so I, I'm really trying to figure out a way not to just write anything, you know, yeah. and just really write what I need to write. And that's something I have yet to learn. Yeah. And I know? think that's, that's something be, uh, us being such newer writers. I think we will figure that out, you know, right. and it's something that I think, I think Neil Gaiman said it was that um, he's like, what, what's really great is when you get to the point where you, you were definitely trudging along, you know, the muse hit and it went with fireworks and you, it was just so easy to write. And then like another time, it'll be like, you're trudging through mud and it's so hard to get those yeah. words out. And, uh, and Stephen King and on, I'm about halfway through on writing. So, um, uh, and he talks some, something similar. It's like he, he hits a certain word count every day, whether it takes him two hours or it takes him 10 hours. You right. know, and, and that's the thing is like, sometimes it's going to take you two hours. Sometimes it's going to take you 10 hours to do the same amount of work. But, but Neil Gaiman said, you know, but when it's really great, when I look back and go, go through the story, I can't pick out those times I was trudging and the times that were easy because the quality of writing is consistent. Cool. And so it's kind of like as writers, I think, you know, we have yet to get, get that self, that confidence that right. those guys have, you know, in their work. And, um, and, the, and we're going to know, you know, when you go back and you read and you're like, this is shit <laughs> or this is great, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I even asked a guy on Facebook, I'm friends with a ton of writers, you know, I'm a avid social media whore. <laughs> um, and a lot of that is actually, it's not just, you know, masturbation or whatever it's actually like i'm focused and networking with uh, yeah honestly i i am I, I am honestly friends on facebook and interact on a semi daily basis with one of my favorite writers of all time mm -hmm. and um i won't mention his name because it'll just make him feel weird but um, <laughs> one of my great heroes of all time i've written this guy fan letters and there he is on facebook and i friended him and he it took my friendship and now we talk it's weird, wow, that's but, um, funny. yeah, but, uh, so I asked another great writer, like, what's the secret? Like the guy's turning out three novels a year or something like that. Jeez. He's written like, you know, 27 novels and 200 short stories or more. And I said, what's your secret to writing that fast? And he told me most writers, when they, when they say they're writing, they're more talking about writing. He says, the, you know, the professional writers, they write, they sit down, they write. Yeah. you know, the next day they sit down, they write. Yeah. And so he's doing it. It's like, a, it's like, it's not like, it's not like um, churn and burn or whatever the term is. It's more, you know, he's, he's focused and he's getting good work done, but he's not wasting his time, you know? Yeah. And I think for myself, I end up wasting a lot of time. And that and, I'm definitely recognizing that about myself is like, really? and my, my downfall came when my social media and my writing ended up on the same computer because before <laughs> my writing, I wrote, I had a laptop that I wrote on and then I had my computer that I did social media and Right. Email. So there were two separate things. They were separate things because I was writing when I would drop my uh, when I would drop my child off somewhere and I had to to wait. That's when I did my writing. And so I was doing about three hours of two to three hours of solid writing um, five days a week. And um, cool. they, they did they took a couple of classes. The, the, they were homeschooled, but they took a couple of classes in high school like um chemistry and things that we couldn't do at home at that point algebra for god forbid algebra you know but um and uh so so i would drop them off at school and i'd go down the street to the library for those last two classes in high school and um and i would write and so i had a really consistent schedule near the end there but i never had it on the same computer and so it was as soon as i created an office and it's all on the same computer it's too easy to 
like it on is. social media. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do with this scene. Oh, I'll just peruse Facebook for a second. I'll take a break. An hour later, two hours later. I go, oh, gosh. Not to mention, you know, trying to get your name out there and stuff. So, I mean, and I wasn't into social media before before I got picked up by a publisher, but my publisher said, I cannot find you online. You have to change that. <laughs> it's like, I can't find you anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I really admire what you've done with social media, the way you've done these videos. I mean, I'm a filmmaker. I could do these videos all day long. I just don't because I'm too fucking lazy. <laughs> um, so I really admire the way you've not only done the videos, but created like your own little s- social space and oh. promoting other people. It's It's been really nice to see your method, you know? Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I couldn't just do it for myself. For, for one, I, it started because I didn't have anything to share. You know, and so it was like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll promote other people. But then it just kind of became like, yeah, I've got to, you know, I just, I have to share this. Yeah, I have to share other people's stuff. It can't just be about me, you know. Well, you know, so it's so cool because now I know who you are. I know your work. I know where you live. I mean, I know your life a little bit and it's really great. I mean, I'm I'm kind of, I know Facebook is evil and all that, but but um at the same time, it's like, it, there's a lot of wonderful things about it, you know, just meeting other people and making new friends. And yeah. I've got so many friends that know who I am and that they care about me as much as they can through the computer, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been a good thing. And I think if you can genuinely network, like, like for instance, um, my first book, the, you know, the almighty blurb um, and, you know, in horror, I'm not sure how it is in fantasy, but in horror and dark fantasy, everybody lives and dies on the blurb. You got to get the blurb. And I had literally nobody to blurb me because I was so new and I had to go on Facebook and beg. And my, uh, um, and my wonderful friend, uh, John Lidwood Grant volunteered. He's I'll read it and I'll blurb it. And, um, but now, now a year later, a year and a half later, I've got literally the industry leaders who I just, I'm friends with them. Now I asked them, Boom. I've got I, everybody I ask, they are like the industry leaders blurb me. And so it feels it feels gratifying in that way that it is actually pretty useful for people like you and I, because we're, we're isolated in our own little space. You know, I'm out here in the countryside of Western North Carolina and you're in rural Oregon. Yeah. And so it, it helps. I mean, I've got friends all over the globe now. And yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in that, you know. Yeah. And, and same here. It's like, I don't, I don't like a lot of aspects of social media, but definitely like I have friends in the Netherlands and the UK and, and tons of writers everywhere. And, you know, I, I've talked to people on this show that, you know, I, one of my guests has like 30 novels and they, you know, a couple of my guests, they don't have a day job. Their job is writing. (laughs) And that's, that's where I want to be. <laughs> and, um, and just, you know, um, ban- I, I, I even had some musicians on here, but, um, you know, I, a couple people, um, that they, they were, they have a review by Stephen King on their book, you know, it's like, so, so it's just great. And, um, and you realize, I think it's important for write authors to realize that, other writers are, are people too. It's yeah. just a bunch of people. Yeah. And so, you know, people like Stephen King and Anne Rice and, you know, all these people that we've fawned over um, earlier in our life, it's great to, to understand that, oh, well, they're just people too. Right. <laughs> and uh, the same struggles and the same battles, you know, and it's, it, you, yeah, and uh, we could, um, I could probably write faster if I didn't have a day job. So, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> Are you working full time? No. Well, I'm a subcontractor, so I make my own schedule and I've been able to make it work within a, I only work like three days a week. So I'm a little, um, I'm a little uh, spoiled in that aspect. And my husband, my husband has a great job career. So I, that's cool. I, yeah. Yeah. That's similar to Definitely. me too. I, I call myself the floater. 
like um, I've got my own business, which is also known as freelancing. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, my wife has got the day job and everything, yeah. and so we have like health insurance and stuff through yeah. her job. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to kind of have a laxer schedule and focus more on my art and stuff. Because honestly, I've done the full time job and oh, writing yeah. thing. And, it's brutal. I mean, I was getting up at like 530 in the morning and it's, I mean, it's hard to concentrate when you're like worried about stressing about your work and stuff. And I honestly don't know how those guys do it. I have a lot of sympathy for people. I have a friend who's a postman and a writer and I just feel for him because he hasn't been in months, you know? Yeah. And I don't, I don't know how people do it and take care of themselves. You know, (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) <laughs> it's all you almost have to choose like am I writing or am I going to do yoga today you know and right. like I don't I never have to make that decision if I don't do yoga and write on the same day that's my fault that is definitely not my schedule you know um and that that is the thing is when I owned my own studio and I was working full time with my studio I wasn't writing and I didn't start writing until I closed my studio down and right. and started just um subcontracting with other companies to teach them yoga, you know, right. and, um, and I could take on more contracts if I wanted to make more money. I just, I don't want to, you know, it's kind of like, I'd love to make more money, but I, I got to write. That's how I'm going to make my money. <laughs> I'm well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, it's important to acknowledge the sacrifices we've made too. Like it's not been, you know, cupcakes and oh. lollipops, you know, I mean, we've, I've sacrificed money too. I mean, we're, we're struggling just like everybody else is. And, You know, you and I and all my friends, I mean, we have turned down, you know, hard, cold cash (laughs) to get the, you know, to chase our art. And it's like, we're not like slackers. We're working really hard, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, When I was finishing mine, I think I was writing 16 hours a day when I, for like three months. For real? Holy shit. when When I realized my novel was actually like, get gonna get finished right and I realized it was a real thing I really cracked down and it was you know the energy was just so I would wake up at like six seven o'clock in the morning and I wouldn't stop until like midnight one two o'clock in the morning you know (laughs) and um it was just like this incredible cert I'm probably exaggerating when I say three months that was probably only sustainable for about a month or six weeks six weeks I think um, where it was to be doing some speed or some math or something during yeah. that time. <laughs> a lot of coffee right. <laughs> yeah but um but my yeah. brain gets tired I just can't do that I can't sustain oh, that level of concentration I can't do it anymore I've tried you know to write like after everybody's gone to bed and I just can't do it so I, yeah. think, I think that was a one-time thing that's not going to ever happen again so you write early in the morning if you can um I I like 10 to 12, whether it's a.m. or p.m. tends to be a good time because um, I chose those times because it can I can be more consistent with those times. Whereas, you know, other times, you know, with my job and stuff, I work like in the afternoon, the three days I work. So I wanted to choose a time that. So, yeah. Yeah, I like to do it fresh. I, I, you know, I rarely write in the evening because it's hard for me to sort of um focus you know so it, it it's usually the first thing of the day for me and uh, you know it may be an hour maybe three hours maybe five hours and then i move on to my work work yeah. um but yeah my writing always comes first no matter oh, what i put the writing wow. first yeah. do you write every day every uh i i try to I, i've um i've taken a break lately because work actually has uh they kind of dumped some stuff on me so i had to like you know self uh self care take a break but um it's good sometimes those breaks can work in your favor too i mean it's one of the you know it's almost like swimming against the tide sometimes you can like use the tide to get you over there a little quicker and yeah. so I, I you know it's cool um but yeah i mean I, I i try to just to stay in the zone you know yeah so but i i enjoy it if i didn't enjoy it i wouldn't do it because I ain't making enough money at it to keep going. Let me put it that way. It's not about the money, you know? Yeah. But um, I'll say this too. There's not a lot of money in film either, at least <laughs> at the level I was working at. I'm an indie, you know, indie filmmaker. So 
um, it's not that much different, you know. Yeah. And film is fun because it's so collaborative. I mean, you're working with actors oh, and yeah. camera people and this and that. And so it's a little more collaborative and writing is a little more like solitary. But um, and I, I can't do the whole like I'm friends with uh, Josh Mallerman, the guy for, who wrote uh, uh, Bird Box. And the guy's turning out like twice, you know, two novels a year. And I'm just like, no, nah, I can't do it. No, I wish I could. Yeah. Yeah. Can't do it. I, I, I think I have one novel a year in me right now. Maybe in the future that will change, but. Do you see yourself writing full time? I, I would. I, I would like to. Yeah, really? I could see it. Um, you know, it's whether or not um, it all works out, right? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm so new at this and um, I don't know what my, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where my publish, I'm going to, I'm actually going to cut this part out. Um, <laughs> but you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Make a gesture, cut this out. Do not post this. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still uncertain of my publisher. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to follow through with marketing and stuff the way I, th th that he claims. I don't know yet. They never do. I mean, that's the whole thing with indie indie publishing. They, there is no marketing. You you are the marketing. Yeah. What you're doing right now is the marketing. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, and like my paperback was put on hold. Um, now, granted, his wife got COVID, so I I'm not holding that against him at all, and she's still getting over it. So um, you know, I'm I'm being I'm trying I'm trying to be patient, and when I do get negative thinking coming up, I kind of call myself back of like, okay, but you know, it's, it's, there is definitely a pattern arising of like, well, in actuality, he said the paperback was going to come out before his wife got COVID, you know? So it's kind of like, all right, well, all right, you know, I'll give him this, but, but we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a little angsty because I, I have, um, booths, uh, in, comic-con in seattle i have a booth um that i i'm paying for you know um and i have a booth at another comic-con in portland and uh i can't do those without a paperback you know right. and so uh i'm, I'm getting antsy because my paperback should have been out by now <clears throat> so and she came down when with COVID. Huh? when is comic-con when is your booth so I don't know if I'm going to make the one in Portland because it's November. Oh, gosh, I think it's next weekend. So I'm not going to make that one. You I know think. what? Um, from my experience, people don't sell that much at those. I mean, you're not missing a whole lot. I don't, I don't want to be sort of defeatist, but, you know, you're, you know, 25 copies or something, you know, I mean, it's cool, but it's not like that big a deal. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the one in Portland is the fifth and sixth. I don't think I'm going to make that one. The other one isn't till like December 12th or something. Um, my paperback should be out by then. Um, and that's the biggest one. And that's, that one's cool because they actually have a room for Pacific Northwest. So it's like an actual thing for this comic con that um, people will actually go specifically to get local art and local writing and stuff. So it tends to be, you know, people go into that room for that purpose. And That's cool. yeah, but I don't know what to expect. I've never done it before. So. Well, uh, off the record, you know, yeah. uh, the thing with me is, uh, same is true of my publisher. I mean, they're very underwhelming. My, my contact, my editor, I mean, she's, she's kind of, like, I, I feel like she's um, a little un, like unhappy just in, in general. And like, if she doesn't like your email, she just won't even respond to it, you know? And it's, it's, I've learned that it's, it's just okay. I just don't, I learned not to take it personally, you know? And um, so yeah, it's, it's not the ideal experience, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. So I, I sympathize with you, you know? Yeah. Hang in there. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of writers they change publishers a lot. And, yeah, I know a couple know. that have. Yeah, and yeah, I, and um, and I think that's okay. I, it's kind of you know, it took me so long that 
I'm really reluctant to look for something else, but I think that's part of my dragging my feet is that I'm sensing, you know, I really want to see what he does with this book um, before I, I hand this other book over to him. And even though he got me writing this book, I, I feel like there might be a little obligation, not that he would hold me to it, but I feel in my, you know, in myself that, well, he got me on the second novel. So maybe, you know, I should give him the chance to, you know, carry it through. And because he's, he's, he's really pushing for the second one because he feels like a debut novel, no matter how good it is, people, pe- a lot of people aren't going to see it. You right. know, nobody knows who I am. So the second right. one will be a little, I'll have a little more traction. And then he's like, the third one's really going to carry you. And people will go and back. And find, yeah. yeah. They're, they're going to go back and they're going to find this novel. But I still want to see how he markets this one. You know, I mean, right now it's only available on Amazon Kindle. That's it. That is the only way anybody can get it. Whereas, you know, there's Barnes and Noble and there's Apple and there's audiobooks and there's, um, he said that, it, you know, local bookstores will be able to, I'll be in the catalog that local bookstores can order from. And I think that's really important. I think I, even though ebooks are such a huge thing, bookstores are still going strong. And I think that it's still a market that can be done. I know tons of people that they won't get the ebook. They want the paperback. That's right. Yeah. Um, Lots of people. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that I, prefer. yeah, I agree with you and I see your point totally. Um, but I will say there's a lot of writers out there who are having like really nightmare experiences with their publishers. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like you dodged a bullet and I also dodged a bullet. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, even before I signed my first contract with those guys, I kind of checked them out and made sure they were, they were reputable because I didn't want to, I, you know, I've, I've done the, I've done the partnership from hell before in movies. And I was just like, nah, I'm not going to do that again. It's almost like a marriage, it, you know, it's like a bad marriage or something. So I was like, I made sure that they were on the up and up and, but on the up and up, I mean, there's no marketing, there's nothing like that. I mean, the only thing they're bringing to the table is their own sort of reputation. And, and you know, and that's a lot. It's a good thing. I mean, they publish some of the greatest writers in the world. So I'm not complaining. I'm literally happy to be there. But at the same time, it's underwhelming in a lot of ways, you know. So. And I think like at the beginning, I said, you know, it's not as it's not all fireworks for sure you know and and I think that's um you know I don't want to sound disappointed that we're ungrateful uh, I I thought it would be bigger and and <laughs> more elaborate you know, it's, it's more funny. exciting you know, I, have, I have a filmmaking friend who just got a deal with the biggest coolest hippest uh horror film uh you know, horror film company in the world. A24, they did Hereditary, oh, yeah. they did some R. He got a deal with them. So he is now working directly with them. They're making his movie, all the money in the world going toward it. And I'm sure he has the same complaints that you and I do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm old enough now to have worked in both industries. And I know that it's, we're all in the same boat, you know, and unless you're Stephen King, it, the rules are the same. And even like on, on Facebook, I'm friends with Ramsey Campbell, who's like a legend and the poor guys, you know, I'm sure he's, he's scraping by, you know, it's hard. Yeah. You know, really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you don't do it for the money. You do it for the love. That's, yeah, that's all I think. Love. <laughs> for the love. All right, Polly. So, um you what do you want people to look for where do they go to buy your book where where's the best place to buy your book that will give you and your publisher the most support well just uh find me on amazon you can uh, find me under polly chattel and i've got uh, a book the occultists i've got a book coming out in january shadow days and i've got three feature films that i wrote and directed um, one of them, the first one's called St. Cole, the second one's called Allison, and the third one's called Quiet River. Mm-hmm. And Amazon's probably the best place to find me. Um, so I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I'm Jude Madelich Hall, and my debut novel, The Everstein Chronicles, is on Amazon now. You can get that. 
And um, so take it away. <laughs> this has been Tiger's Talking Tittles. <laughs> like and subscribe, bitches. 